Mac Power Users, episode 534, The Business of Emoji with Jeremy Burge. Hello and welcome back to Mac Power Users. My name is Stephen Hackett and I'm joined as always by my friend and yours, Mr. David Sparks. Hello, Mr. Hackett. How are you today? Pretty well, David. How about you? I am looking forward to this show. Uh, for the longest time, we've wanted to have Jeremy Burge on the show, and here he is. Welcome, Jeremy. Hello, friends. I'm uh, coming to you fresh after my first five-week shave, so I uh, hope this is nice and clear on the audio. <laughs> five weeks? You just went for the quarantine beard, huh? Yeah, I was going all hard into it, and then I did this uh, murder mystery party the other day, and I really wanted to make sort of a mustache instead, so I shaved the mustache, and then obviously it looks... It's not really my thing, so I, I had to complete the job, uh, unfortunately. My my barbershop is closed. I am starting to look a lot like Ken Burns. I don't know <laughs> how else to put it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with the, the hair on my head. I've never grown really hair longer than sort of, I don't know, about how long it is now. About six weeks of growth is the longest I think I've ever had, but I'm I'm keen to, to see it out. I think it'll be interesting. I don't know how to grow long hair. I don't know... Uh, what to do and how to make that work, but I'm interested to see what happens. I've had the same haircut my entire life, except for a short period in the 70s where I did an experiment with it over the ear, and that only lasted like six <laughs> weeks. So I, I'm in new territory as well, Jeremy. This is I'm not, I'm not sure about this. I'm in full Muppet mode. There's just it's, <laughs> yeah. there's hair everywhere. I've got a mustache. It's all very confusing. Anyways... <laughs> Welcome to Mac Power Users, everybody. Yeah. We're talking about haircuts. <laughs> and now we're over the haircut corner. Let's yep. uh, let's continue with the Mac Power Users. <laughs> D- done with that. Uh, so, Jeremy, welcome. You are one of my favorite people on the internet because your job is just uh, amazing to me, and you have crafted a corner for yourself in the internet where you are. I mean, it's like I follow you on Twitter, right? It's like, oh, I'm on CNN this week. Oh, I got quoted in the Wall Street Journal. Like, it's it's amazing. Um, plus you're just one of my favorite people. You are fun to be with. And I, I, I'm like David have been looking forward to this. Um, before we get into sort of, uh, your job now as the, uh, you're the chief emoji officer at Emojipedia, we should say, uh, your professional life revolves around emoji, but what, what, tell us a little bit about, uh, your background, maybe in technology or, or else. All right. Yeah. I mean, so you're, you're right. These are all, all good points that, uh, at the moment I do pretty much. Only emoji-related things before that. Uh, I mean, I've worked at a pizza restaurant before. Um, I've worked at a shed factory. Let me think. A building company. Uh, I don't think there's many. I think... (laughs) I guess there's not a real clean trajectory into emoji. right? Like There's not a well-worn path. Yeah, there's not a clean cut. But (laughs) nonetheless, I did vaguely. There was a window for a decent amount of time where I kind of worked in tech. I was doing... Kind of web consulting, I guess you could call it. I don't think I don't know what what did you call that back in two thousand and three through mm. seven? What what did you call those people who sort of didn't necessarily build your website but kind of did stuff? I guess web developer generally. Yeah, yeah, I like I consultant. Know. You know, you're you're telling people what they should spend their money on. Yeah, so I did a bunch of that, and it was fine. I I kind of liked it. You know, I got to hang out with people. Never been good at the code, but always been reasonable at the rest of it, and. I don't know. I guess I, I got a little bit bored of it, and emojis were like they they were sort of a fun thing that were came into my world because well, I guess a lot of my clients were like universities. So when, as soon as emoji was around, people were keen to you know kind of play with them. So yeah, I've got a, a pretty mixed background and never really had a public facing role until Emojipedia went from being like. I don't know, a pretty niche, weird corner of the internet where no one really cared less who I was because who even visited this Emojipedia website to now, it's kind of, I don't know, it's become like a public role instead of a a nerdy background role. Hmm. It's just crazy because, as I understand it, kind of started as a passion project that turned into a career for you. And yeah, those are the best, right? Yeah, I mean, I I honestly thought it was just a fun little project. You sort of do a few things about emojis, put some on the internet, do some research, and yeah, I mean, I I thought people would like a website about any every emoji that exists, but I didn't ever foresee 
it's sort of becoming an emoji spokesperson. You know, like when the news, when something <laughs> happens, there's always weird cultural things that happen and somehow they intersect with emoji. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of this shared experience we all have. And then right. I guess the media or people, they want to speak to someone about it. And I guess inevitably, if you've run an emoji website for the last seven or so years of your life, that's that's the person maybe they want to speak to. I think one of my my favorite cultural moments was the debate about the cheeseburger emoji and which side was it which side the lettuce should go on above or below the burger the cheese the, the cheese. cheese do you want the cheese on top of the burger or underneath the burger right. the meat that is the meat of the burger and uh, I don't know what do you what do you guys think um, above the the meat or below the meat I think the only proper way is you put the cheese above the meat I agree Seems reasonable. And that's, I guess, the internet agreed as well. But uh, unfortunately, the CEO of Google decided to make a little funny tweet uh, to sort of say that, oh, we're going to fix our cheese and put it on top of the burger on Monday. Stat, we're going to drop tools and do this. And he thought it would be funny. The whole internet took it seriously or didn't take it seriously. But you know how media has this weird way of having to report on a thing but do it straight faced rather than just say this was a joke? They kind of all reported on it like, well, this is definitely happening. And I don't know, it became became a whole big thing. Mm-hmm. It tore families apart, left and right. <laughs> well, I, for a minute there, I was wondering if the MPU was going to continue when I was waiting for Stephen's answer. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I'll tell you, and for I just wanted to come before we dig in, for listeners who aren't uh, familiar with Jeremy, Jeremy isn't just the guy who made Emojipedia. It's like... Um, you are a massive influencer in the world of emoji. I mean, you're on the Unicode committee that decides what the next emoji are. Jeremy, years ago, came up with the idea for Emoji Day, right? <laughs> I, it was. Yeah. It, it, tell me if I'm wrong. This has you like on a lark one day. You're like, well, let's have an, a World Emoji Day, and then now it is World Emoji Day. You created a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that yeah that was that is pretty much what happened. And what was odd is so, I mean, it was about a year into running Emojipedia, and I don't know. I guess like people do, you see all these days on the internet, and you think, well, why can't we have an emoji day? So I just sort of put out some tweets to just say to, I guess, declare it. I just sort of said, well, July seventeen is World Emoji Day. We're going to be celebrating emojis, and by the end of that first World Emoji Day. You know, people had a bit of fun, but already a few sort of brands and things hopped on board. Like, I don't know whether they knew that I just made it up five days earlier or what, but sort of brands were starting to do giveaways by the end of the day. And then in the years to come, then it just sort of got bigger and bigger until bizarre scenes of being on red carpets and and things like that in the last Mm -hmm. few years have really uh, been quite unexpected. I didn't expect to be on any emoji red carpets when starting a website. (laughs) And the date, July 17th, is a point where our interests intersect because the calendar emoji shows July 17th. And the reason for that is that iCal for the Mac was introduced at Macworld, I think in 2002, 2001, 2002, on July 17th. And so like the date that iCal was introduced ended up on the emoji, ended up on the holiday. So I always uh, think about you when that comes around. It's like we have this little intersection in what we cover uh, on this like one really weird story. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, that's the reason that I was sort of tossing up different dates to put it on. I did think of actually putting it the first iOS release that had an emoji in it, but it just seemed too obscure. And obviously the calendar's like right in your face, you see it. And it is a fun like bit of sort of Apple trivia. And because it didn't have, I say, strong significance already, I think I'd have felt bad putting a World Emoji Day if there was a really strong meaning. But like Alpha Mac, it's like, you know, it's a cute uh, footnote in history, but no one's no one's going to be confused about the difference between World Emoji Day and when iCal was introduced. But yeah, it's sort of a, a nice little nod to, to history there. Well, that's how I celebrate it. I celebrate it as iCal Day. I don't know what you're doing, <laughs> but it's iCal Day to me. Yeah, another thing that Jeremy does every year, because you sit on the committee that picks the new emoji, you do you commission an artist and you do the first video of all the new emoji that they you know they allow in every year and. You do these very high quality artworks. In fact, we may have to talk about that later in the show, how you get that done. But this is one of the very few times a year that I am cool in my kids' eyes because I can always point them because I know what day it's going to come out. And I, you know, I wait for Jeremy's video and I send it to the kids and say, hey, here's all the new emoji. And then all of a sudden, this 
this nerd dad has one useful feature to them that he can show <laughs> that, uh, uh, what the new emoji are, because that's a big deal to them. It is, it is a big deal. People care. And the reason we started doing those images was that, I mean, like Unicode, the body that approves the new emoji list, they're not that interested in what they look like. I mean, the emoji subcommittee sort of is. They're the sort of, there's different tiers of this all, but... In reality, Unicode's there to encode like what the new emoji is, and it's up to the platforms. It's up to Apple and Google and the like to design what their platform looks like. And the issue we had was sort of a vaguely a news publisher as well. We published news about new emoji stuff. And as you all know, like pictures tell the story, right? And it became ridiculous the first year when I was writing about new emoji stuff, writing about what they were and writing a big list of the names of them. And then I was just like this is what on earth am I doing? Why aren't we like having some pictures to go with them? And Unicode have these generally pretty bad images. They've got better over the years, but sort of proposal author technical images in a list and they looked awful to publish. So I just thought, well, why don't we get someone? Uh, Joshua Jones is our designer. He's a long-term Mac icon designer as well. He used to do, what has he done? He's done one of those CD burning uh, icons. Is it burn? Was that the name of it? Or fire, one of them. Anyway, he's a, a long-term Apple sort of designer, and thought, well, why not get him to to imagine the whole set as sort of a first pass to get a. It gives you the picture better than a whole list of words. It's always funny to me though how similar the ones that Google and Apple create look to yours. It's almost like you guys are kind of setting the look for these things by getting out there so early. Yeah, there's some sort of public sentiment. Samsung in particular, I don't mind. And I've got to say on the record, I genuinely don't care if any of the companies look like ours. I think it's sort of a bit of an honor. It's kind of fun when you look through the list and you go, oh, yeah, like it must be frustrating sometimes if you are one of those companies and you think, what's the best way to draw this emoji? And you can't come up with something better than your choices are to make it different just for the sake of it or to just roll with something that's similar to what we've done, and that's fine. But some of them from Samsung, more than any other vendor in recent years, just a few in each set, you kind of get the impression that maybe a design team there was given our list and just said, can you just just redraw these five? Because some of them are more similar than I've seen from any other platform, and that always amuses me a little bit, because I know that must be what's happening behind the scenes sometimes. Well, it's great, and it's such a big contribution you make to the community. Um, emoji are an interesting topic. Uh, sometimes we hear from listeners are like, you know, grumpy about it. Yeah, it's stupid. You know, I don't want emoji. You know, we just want to use words. But uh, I have come to find that they're very useful because you're trying to communicate emotion, you know, as the name implies, with simple text, especially in text messages. And an emoji a lot of times can really get the point across. So you don't sound like a you're being, you know, sarcastic, or maybe you do want to sound like you're being sarcastic. I don't know, but it, I, I, I think they serve a purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they definitely have their place. Yeah, they're definitely, uh, they're definitely useful for different reasons. There is that. There is sort of the. It, it's become the escalation of words in a way where now it's at the point where if you don't send an emoji, it's almost implied that you're you are upset. You almost have to send one to just uh, make sure that people realize that you're you're in a friendly mood and you're, you're not upset with them. But yeah, they're also playful, and the fact that they indicate you spent a bit of time on a message more than perhaps not sending them. If you send a little string of different emojis at the end of your message, then. Yeah, it's, it, it shows you paid some attention. It's, it's. I think it's a nice thing in general. I think very few people, other than those that get mad on some kind of principle about them ruining language or something, I feel like for the most part, you get an emoji, you're pretty happy with it, right? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the gear you're using to get uh, to get your work done, running your business, Emojipedia, doing this this media work. Uh, what sort of Apple gear is at your fingertips? I'm, I'm a pretty... I know we're on this the power user podcast, uh, Mac power users, but uh, I've always been kind of a cafe kind of working guy. So I've always been keen on keeping my hardware down because I like to be out and about. And uh, so that continues to today where I get all my work done in exclusively on my 13 inch MacBook Pro. That does literally everything for me that I need it to do. Uh, my job has a pretty wide variety of different things that I do that especially I say back in the day, even today, I still do a lot of the work at Emojipedia. Thankfully, we have other people who are more skilled in some areas now, but I still fill in the gaps of every little bit. So sometimes I'm 
batch renaming a bunch of files and things, so I need things like a better finder rename. Uh, I'm dealing with a lot of files when we get images. Each emoji set has sort of 3,000 or more images in it. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff that goes on there. So, I, so in my mind, the Mac is what I need there to move everything around. I've got my iPhone, I've got my iPad, but really I just use the iPad to play uh, mini motorways and read the newspaper. <laughs> That's funny. I actually just spent uh, a couple days ago a good bit of time with a better finder rename, which is this Mac utility. And it can name files based on all sorts of things. And you can put spacing in, you can do all this sorting. It is really powerful. I basically had uh, like 10 or 11 subfolders with hundreds of text files in them each. And I wanted them all on one level, but I basically wanted to use the parent folder name and the file name. Like it can do all sorts of things. And that's definitely a Mac utility that if you deal with a lot of files and you're trying to organize them, Finder and Automator can go part of the way in renaming, but this application can do some simply amazing things. Yeah, there's. Uh, I, I don't use more than 10% of it. I can see there's so much more than I need, but I know if there's anything to do with file renaming, I know it can do it. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what I like about it, that there's uh, no matter how obscure my question is about sort of, as you say, like whether you're getting the directory names to sort of uh, compile into a file name, which is sometimes useful. Uh, whether you're trying to, you can save sort of, I guess, what they call droplets, which are sort of mini applications that run a certain set of uh, renames on a file based on certain parameters. And as I say, it's one of those things that for us, the file names are super, super important because each Unicode emoji has its own set of uh, code points, and we use the code points in the file names, but there's just a lot of weird quirks of history where code points have changed from Japan to the rest of the world. Uh, that you've got cases where sort of people, it, does, it shouldn't affect end users, but where the same image is used in multiple different code points. Uh, for instance, uh, what's a good example? Maybe in, in recent years, there was often the case before there were these gender neutral emojis where there would be an emoji that technically had no gender, but it would show as the man or the woman. It's just at a code level, but we would need to run some tools to make sure that we go, well, that's not one emoji, that's two emojis, and we need to flag that from a whole big list. And yeah, file renaming, as as I say, basic as it is, it gets it gets quite complicated. So a better finder rename is, yeah, massively one of my go-to tools. Uh, this app has been around a long time. I was just trying to look up when it got started, because I think we talked about this on MPU like 10 years ago. And it's a, it's an app I also keep on my Mac. I don't use it very often, but sometimes, just like you, I get fed a bunch of files. Usually for me, it's on the legal side. You know, a, a case I'm working on, somebody gives me 10,000 files and they have really whack, wacky names and I need to go through and kind of sort that out. Or when I do documents for production and man, this app, it's like you, it, it feels to me like kind of like a Hazel or a keyboard maestro in the sense that you can use it, you know, to a very shallow uh, degree, or you can use it to a very deep degree. And it just depends. Uh, for most people, we go as deep as we need, and then we stop. But this app goes pretty deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's one of my go-tos. And just for files in general, I guess I find uh, that I know I'd love to move to a more iOS-based system. And I know people that do use iOS productivity are have different apps. So some of this is just me being using the tools I've used for a long time, but also file management is, I think, a, a skill that the Mac does pretty well overall and has these great tools. Another one I use is uh, RetroBatch, which is a batch image renaming, uh, image resizing tool. Same sort of thing, but has lots of parameters and you can dump a bunch of images there and output them in whatever size or shape you want. And yeah, small things like that, I just find I can really get that work done quickly. And sometimes it's a matter of, I say breaking news for us every now and then. Sometimes we we know in advance what's happening and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we do need to crunch and get 3,000 images ready to go in, I say, seconds, minutes. Like the the internet cares about the emoji updates now, especially from Apple. I mean, five years ago, people wouldn't know about an emoji update till we published something. Often there'd be a new emoji update and it came out three weeks ago and no one had said a single thing about it. Uh, because the changes were minor or they just hadn't noticed. Whereas these days, as soon as, let's say, Apple in particular releases a new beta that has any emoji update or change, you are seeing people on it within minutes, which is something I've never seen before. So being able to quickly resize and rename images 
on the fly is super important for me. I mean, it even seems like Apple is using emoji as a hammer to get users to get the point one updates on their devices. Because for several years now, the emoji release has been the the big point one, which is also a lot of bug fixes on major OS releases. But who wants to download bug fixes? But if you put the emoji in there, it's like the carrot that gets everybody to install it. Yeah, I, I wonder if this was a happy accident at first, but it has become a deliberate plan. There were a few years where emoji updates came out in different releases. Uh, what was it? iOS 10 a few years ago had half of the new emoji update, and then iOS 10.2 had the rest. But then since then, we've had every year 11 uh, and 12 have just but have done it in the point release. So yeah, you're right. I think that's a clever strategy that maybe apple stumbled upon by accident but it now works well for them you do your big update for the year that has plenty of attention probably a bunch of bugs and then a month later you come out with the update that's not as exciting fixes a bunch of bugs but brings the emoji update and that's sort of the maybe the mass market release so so which 13 inch macbook pro do you have uh, that is a good. I have the what is it? I bought it last year were there two mac updates last year i'm not sure it's a 2019 macbook pro I think there was just one to the 13-inch last year. I think so. I like the 13-inch size for me. It's the right size. Even though I, I would prefer a bigger space sometimes, I also like to move about. So I don't want anything bigger than a 13-inch. So for me, that's I need to get the Pro also because I like a big internal storage. So I have no choice of getting a MacBook Air or something. The 2 terabyte drive is essential for me. Yeah, well, I, I think you can get the air now to two terabytes, but I also think with the kind of stuff you do, you probably the additional processing power would be of use. Yeah, I'd say it's helpful. And I guess by the time I buy a new Mac, I'm always getting the highest capacity. And I think maybe by now you could probably, if if not on the current yeah. updates, if, if not this year, you'd be able to get a four terabyte. I know four terabytes for a few years has only been on the 15-inch model. Because I think, I think I was... Trying to, it's on two SSDs, or at least was at the time where the 15 inch model could always have double the capacity of the 13 because mm -hmm. it was two of the biggest SSD. So that's always been my one thing holding me, tempting me to get a 15 inch. But as long as I can keep my content under the size of the 13 inch maximum size, then that's what I get. It just hits me once in a while when I hear people say it's like four terabyte ssd is now completely doable i mean it's it's not cheap but it's it's a realistic possibility in a laptop and you just you just have to like grind on that just for a second what <laughs> four terabytes yeah. ssd <laughs> yeah, they, yeah you can do that now. yeah i've spent my entire working life my my one goal has always been to keep everything that i all my data on one laptop hard drive so I don't have to, you know how people get into the whole hassle of you have an external drive, but then you need to up, back up the external drive, so you need another external drive. And I know these days there's raids and there's all kinds of uh, network storage and the like, but as someone who's quite flexible and currently living on a boat, which maybe, maybe we'll have a chance to chat a bit about later, but storage is... Uh, space in the world is an issue for me that having a bunch of external hard drives or network storage is not a goer for me so uh just having the biggest size laptop that i can have literally everything that i've ever produced on that one machine is is amazing and that you're right it's incredible to me that we can even do that that i can have everything ever on this one little laptop well, and that's really something about your story that I think is really interesting because in the world today, a lot of us have multiple computers. I have multiple computers, multiple iPads even. And, you know, the, the cloud technology makes it pretty easy to do that now, much easier than it used to be. But there still is something to be said for the simplicity of what you said at the beginning of the show, just one machine with all your data on it. A few years ago, I tried the whole multiple Mac thing, but I just... The, time, the the efficiency of my life, never having to think about what's on which machine, uh, which cloud sync is working, that obviously I run cloud backups and the like, but again, it doesn't matter because I know the original data is on this Mac. I never have to think about different screen resolutions and moving my app layouts around. It's just the same Mac every day, whether I'm at home or whether I'm out and about. Not right now, mostly at home, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, it, it's it, mentally for me, I don't know, I'm I'm not a... I'm not great at multitasking and something about just having the exact setup every single time just really works for me. I can totally see that. We hear from listeners all the time that do it. We don't have enough guests that, that do that though, because 
we tend towards the super nerdy, you know, guess. And, <laughs> and the nerdy, the nerdier you are, the more likely you're to have multiple devices, I think. Yeah, I think so. And I, I just, in general, have a slight aversion to just owning too much stuff. It makes me anxious owning too many things. So I like to, I'll spend whatever it takes to get the best 13 inch MacBook Pro. That's fine. But then, like, it would just stress me out having too many other bits and pieces. I, I even, I don't know. It's it, even having my iPad feels unnecessary sometimes, although I like sort of using it for entertainment. It's just, yeah, something about it. I just like not taking up much space in the world and the idea that. If I wanted to pack my bags and go anywhere, I can put everything in one bag and go and not even have to think about, you know, what all my other technology is doing. Yeah, I get it. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Text Expander. Save time typing and boost your productivity with Text Expander. Go to textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more and get 20% off. Text Expander is the starting point for automation on the Mac, iPad, and iPhone. If you type something more than three times, make it a snippet and let Text Expander type it for you. And using TextExpander.com's synchronization engine, you can make a snippet on one computer and use it on all of your devices so you're more productive everywhere you type. It's remarkable to me how much more powerful text expansion can be with Text Expander because of its inclusion of things like the ability to insert a variable where you can, you know, insert type the name of the person or grab the contents of the clipboard or even use an Apple script to make your text automation all that more powerful. There's so much you can do with this app. I did a bunch of screencasts for them a few years ago. You can see it over on their website at textexpander.com. They also host interesting webinars every month with Text Expander for Beginners, Advanced, and Team webinars to learn more about boosting your productivity. To get in one of those webinars, just go to textexpander.com slash webinar. If you're into productivity and you want simply the best text expansion tool, it's Text Expander. It's now available for Mac OS, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad, and you can get 20% off by going to textexpander.com slash podcast and let them know you heard about it here on the Mac Power Users. Thanks, Text Expander, for all of your support of the Mac Power Users. Jeremy, one of the things you mentioned earlier is that you live on a boat. And uh, I was joking with you before the show that you're doing all this at sea, but you're not really at sea. But could you explain to the audience your uh, current living conditions? Yeah, so I, I am on a boat. I moved into a boat about a year ago now. So it's sort of, it's still new, not necessary, but I've, I've got the hang of it a bit more now. It's a good time to reflect on what, how things are going. But for those not aware of the British canal system, there's a lot of boats over here in the UK that are, they're called narrow boats over here. Internationally, some people might know them as a sort of a long boat or like a skinny Dutch barge, perhaps. Uh, they're quite distinct in the UK. There's a lot of them and they tend to be quite, quite narrow. You can touch both walls with your hands from the inside. Uh, but then if you walk the length of it, it's quite wait, long. Wait, 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 wait. I... I got to get this straight. So you can stand in the middle and touch both sides? Just, just. Um, it's like a floating hallway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. the hallway's on one side of the boat, and if I was to stand in the middle of the room, I could just, at the end of my fingertips, just touch both walls on either side in an average room, and then obviously the length. So the layout of the boat is that you have the room stacked in order with a very small hallway down the side. Could you give me some pictures for the newsletter and maybe we can put them in the links too? I'd like to, if you're willing, I know it's your house, but. Yeah, yeah, I'm more than happy to, more than happy to. So to, to, so to give you a mental, a mental model of how it works is you sort of, you get in the front, uh, different boats have very different layouts. Uh, some of them have sort of the communal area at the front or the back, but effectively this is a boat where it's very long and narrow and you hop in the front and there's sort of an indoor outdoor area. It's sort of got a canvas cover. So it's protected from the rain, but effectively treat it like it's semi-outdoors uh, for the purposes, especially of theft. It's not locked up. It's zipped up and down. Anyone could walk by and take anything out of there. Not that I've had that happen. <laughs> then you come into the main cabin and you've got the lounge and that's an open plan with the kitchen. The next room that I'm in right now, in order, is what they call the dinette on a boat. It's kind of like, uh, it's like a booth at, at, a, at a diner. Uh, basically, it's a booth style yeah. layout with a big table in the middle, and that converts into a spare bedroom if you'd like it to. And then you go through and you have the bathroom with a shower, toilet, all that, and the main bedroom at the back, and then you steer from the very back of the boat. So it's, it's, it's there's a bit going on, but it's just everything is three-quarter size. And you're not at sea, but you're just traversing the UK 
through the canal system. Yes, the canal network in the UK is pretty extensive. They, they've restored a lot of it, and it was very big for transporting coal 100, 200 years ago, and, and all kinds of freight. And these days, a lot of the network's intact. So you can get through, especially England and Wales in particular, you can get to a lot of the country just by cruising around. It's, it's flat. There's no waves. You do also sometimes take these boats on rivers. You just have to be a bit more cautious when you're on a river of tides and... You need to know what you're doing a bit more on the river, whereas the canals, they're pretty basic. They're very flat water, man-made, deliberately for moving things about, big, heavy objects around. So it's quite a pleasant place to be. That's cool. But it, I must uh, present some technology challenges. I mean, you you, you can't have uh, your plugged-in Ethernet, right? Because you're at, <laughs> you're, you've got a layer of water between you and the land. That is true. I mean, I could, I guess, run an internal network with Ethernet inside if I wanted to. There might be. Uh, I mean, some people on boats actually like to stay put. It's not really for me. Um, I like to move around, but there's different considerations depending on what you do. So for people who stay in one place a lot, say at a marina, there's often what they'll call shoreline power, which is just yeah, regular hookups, electricity yeah. current. So you don't need to think about your arrangements so much then. Whereas... For me, I'm on the go a lot. I'm often in the middle of nowhere. And yeah, I guess the main considerations are power. How big How big are the batteries, the solar? How much energy are, are you using? And then internet, obviously, is the other big one. Um, so they're the two main considerations to keep in mind for, for those. We've got an app, which keeps an eye on the battery monitor situation. So we know how much battery we've got all, at all times and what we're using. And then on the internet side of things, I have a 4G modem. Uh, it's a Wi-Fi. It's got Wi-Fi in it for the internal network on the boat. And then we run an external antenna because a big steel box floating on water is an awful way to get an internet signal. So we have an antenna sitting up the top and that runs inside with three different SIM cards so we can switch around the networks depending on which part of the country we're in. So you've basically got a fancy cellular internet connection. Yeah, yeah. We're always on cellular, which... You know, it's not perfect. If I was a gamer, it might not be great. But for what I do, I mean, I do a lot of stuff on the internet, but it's it's never high bandwidth. I mean, even us chatting now, we're just doing an audio chat and the connection's yeah. fine for audio. Video, it's decent. If you were someone that really did need gigabytes of data coming and going, you might have issues. But honestly, even things like Backblaze for cloud backups on my Mac, they still run fine i'll pause it if we're in a very remote area where the internet's awful and that's where Macs kind of don't handle themselves that well in very low internet situations but yeah. for the most part a cellular connection's fine these days especially when you got a choice of networks yeah it does seem like the cellular networks aren't as they aren't as punitive now for people that use a lot of data i mean for sometimes it was very expensive uh, it's, it's to even imagine running your whole your whole internet connection on cellular for a whole month but especially when you're running a website as a business. But I, I imagine it's probably not super expensive to do that now. In the last year, it's it's transformed. The, the UK in the last few years has really come a long way that now two of our three sims are unlimited internet with no speed caps at all. And they're sort of 50 pounds a month. So what's that? $80 a month US, roughly 60 wow. US even. So yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't know what happened in the last year, but somehow we've gone from... About a year ago, we sort of had about a 500 gigabyte limit a month, which could be challenging when you're doing backups and any kind of downloads to unlimited on two out of the three sims. So actually, I don't know what happened in the world, but it's it's great for me <laughs> having a genuinely unlimited connection. You don't have to worry about all the, the iCloud syncing and backup syncing. I'm just imagining like if you got your your boat, you call it a vessel or a boat. I always mess those terms up. I'm not sure. I'd call it a boat. I feel right, like so, I feel like a boat's fine. I, I'm just imagining if Stephen were visiting you with his Mac Pro, mm -hmm. you'd get it like on the river, and Stephen would turn on his Mac Pro, and your battery would be like <laughs> the needle would just go down. <laughs> oh boy! Yeah. You guys would be yeah. adrift. Stephen have to get out and row. Maybe yeah, you could row be, with the. <laughs> I don't know. We'd row with the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd be interested to see. Yeah, I, I actually don't know how much power the Mac Pro draws that you kind of get used to. When you ve when I very first moved into this boat, what I'd do is I'd basically plug things in one at a time and watch the battery monitor to see the amp hours measurement, which mm -hmm. is sort of the most useful measurement for the boat to know how many amp hours are you using at a time. And you'd sort of know, 
on average, let's say turning on a light used one amp hour or maybe a half, then if you turn on your computer and it used five, you'd kind of have a relative idea in your head of sort of how many you want to keep under, and then you do the maths to figure out how long, how many days of of electricity that gives you. And uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, what the the trick on the boat though is to try and get as much to be twelve volt DC current as you can. So that means like the cigarette lighters in your car, yeah. or if you have a caravan. If you can get anything on USB, for 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 me, that's been the absolute key because then you don't need to run an inverter to convert it to your AC power, and that that's amazing. And because nearly everything runs on USB these days, and but would it make sense to like like I know like companies like Anchor make those multi port USB chargers, but they still run on uh, alternating current, and would probably need a converter to to power one of those. So, uh, what type of USB chargers are you using? Uh, yeah, so you're you're right. Those ones there. We're not. I'm right now in a marina because of the whole lockdown situation. So I'm using one of those plugged into a regular power outlet because when you're plugged in, it you don't need to be as efficient with your use. But yeah, the trick is around the boat. You can actually get some really great electronics these days, which effectively, if you imagine again the sort of round cigarette lighter socket that you get that yeah. do uh, USB C, and you can get sort of one USB C and two. Uh, traditional USB-A ports on one of those that will be able to charge a MacBook Pro and an iPhone and, say, charge a battery all at the same time off one single 12-volt socket. They do an amazing job. They seem to have their own power management built in. You can get more, you can get cheap ones and more expensive ones, and some of the the better ones are just, yeah, they're, the, they're quite small, and they will be able to charge a MacBook Pro straight out of a cigarette lighter socket with, with no issues. Yeah, most of the cars in the U.S. now have a lot. Of, a lot of the newer ones have USB ports in them, but not cigarette lighters because nobody smokes in their cars anymore. So it's kind of funny. Um, and even USB C is popping up in vehicles. Uh, you know, my wife's van has two USB A ports in the front, but I think even like the year newer has as USB C. Like it's amazing how USB has just become the the power standard for so many things. Like you said. Yeah, uh, and for me, buying anything, the first thing I check is, can I get it with USB? Because if it doesn't have USB, if it comes on traditional power, you can buy other power packs, but you've actually got to be much smarter than I am at figuring out the voltage in the amps to make sure you get the right <laughs> power adapter. I've blown up a few things trying to do that. Um, the the main thing that happens is you tend to blow up whatever charging device you're trying to use because your, mm-hmm. your appliance <laughs> is trying to draw too much power off some kind of crummy cable or adapter. Uh, but if you can get it USB, then generally, and if you have these sort of decent adapters that convert to USB or USB-C, they do all the hard work, then the USB standard handles the rest, and you're gold. So that's that's where we're at today, that everything on the boat is USB except for the television, and oh, is there anything else that's... And the washing machine. They're the only two things I have that plug into traditional power. What was the biggest surprise for you in terms of your technology when you moved onto the boat? It was definitely not having any clue what power draw anything took. I don't think I had a, a, you know, you hear about max efficiency and you hear about chips improving uh, power usage, but you really don't have any metric for what's going on until you really need to keep track of that. Whether that's the difference between being able to stay somewhere for two days or five days is the difference between whether you're running inefficient apps on your Mac Chrome on my Mac has been booted off because I can't stay out in the countryside as long as it wastes my Mac battery so quickly I need to charge it twice as much. I had a listener write me. uh, Him and his wife bought matching MacBooks, and they thought hers was broken because she was getting half the battery life he was. And they kept bringing it to the Apple Store, and they were running diagnostics, and they couldn't figure it out. And then finally, we had mentioned on the show how inefficient um, Chrome is. And this is a couple years ago. And... He uh he took Chrome off his wife's computer and her battery matched his it fixed the battery. It's it's just amazing to me <laughs> how little care Google has in terms of your battery. Yeah. Uh so I, that's been a big factor for me is keeping an eye on which apps do what. That that's been a big part. Also, Qi charging, I never understood the the appeal. Let's say on the land, uh, I never understood why anyone would want to do that. And in fact, it's probably not the most efficient way to charge, but two things that it does which are quite helpful when you're living on a boat. Uh, one is that doing a lot of power draw at the same time is problematic, that you're better off charging one laptop than charging another one, than charging both at the same time. 
that you'll get a long you'll get more battery use out of that. So Qi charging is relatively doesn't use a bunch of power, so it's not as fast, but the real benefit isn't a tech benefit, it's just a life benefit that on a boat all the furniture's built in. So there's nowhere to hide cables. So if you have sort of Qi chargers placed all around the boat, you can carefully put the cable where you want it to go and then never touch it. Whereas if you have traditional cables, they sort of dangle everywhere and there's nowhere to hide them like you have in a normal cabinet or desk or whatever people have back on land. Yeah, and also you have the advantage of not really being at sea. So your boat isn't pitching. They're not going to go flying off. (laughs) Yeah, we're not rocking around. Yeah. Although when I first bought this, there was a television that wasn't mounted on board. It was quite an old one and I wanted to replace it. But nonetheless, on my very first journey steering my house and boat uh, <laughs> steering my I did house hit a wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i did uh manage to lightly knock a, a bit of a wall of the canal bank and came inside to find the television smashed on the floor because <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, no. you do want to mount yeah you want to mount things like the tv but otherwise no it's it's very calm and you can have your tea or coffee sitting there and it's not gonna slide off the table or anything but uh, yeah, it's 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 worth it's worth mounting things like a television anyway, because R.I.P. the TV that came on this boat. So sad. <laughs> I could I could totally see myself getting lost in something like that. I actually there's a part of me that's like a a minimalist to a sickening degree. Like sometimes I watch those tiny house videos on YouTube. I'm like, yeah, I could do that. I don't see why not. You, you probably could. It, it isn't. I think it's a the best time it's ever been to do something like this because. Laptops are more efficient than they've ever been. Phones are. Mobile internet is great. Things like Wi-Fi is excellent. Uh, yeah, we're just in an era. Even LED lighting, that sort of thing. When this boat was built 20 years ago, it would have had none of that. So if anything, it's over capacity for a modern lifestyle where you don't need that much stuff. And if you have an internet connection and if you have efficient devices, you can live a pretty normal life. And I really, really want to bring on this USB-C era where I can get rid of my cable bag, though, because that's sort of the last thing remaining in the clutter section that you still need. USB to lightning, USB-C to lightning, and various forms of USB-A sitting around. I just really want to... I love an era where you could have a boat decked out with USB-C ports that power everything. That would be incredible in my mind. I think you've got a while on that one, Jeremy. (laughs) Yeah, I gave up. I gave up the resistance a while ago that I thought... Here's my time, and it clearly wasn't the time, so now I just put up with a mix of cables like you and everyone else on the planet, I guess. Yeah, everyone's got that somewhere, right? Just, you never know. The The one thing you get rid of will be the one thing you need. That's how it goes. Yeah, uh, so yeah, that's where we're at. Especially if you're Steven, you need to pl- plug a 20-year-old monitor into your, your Mac Pro. I that's mean, right. <laughs> I think Steven is dongle, hashtag dangle, dongle life forever, man. I mean, yeah. you've got to keep all of those. I'm actually... <laughs> Actually, working on a video where I am blindfolded and trying to identify different adapters by feel. So keep an eye out <laughs> for that. <laughs> You'd need um, what they do on some of the boats. They carry a separate boat behind them, like a trailer of a car. Uh, you can yeah. put all your Macs in, in the back boat. That's they call right. it Butty. And it's like, yeah, a boat with no engine. Just You could be dragging around the network yeah. one of them out the back. Yeah. Is it, what, what did the listeners decide your office is? The Mac? The Mac Shack. The Mac Shack. That would be the, the Mac Barge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i think that'll be fun <laughs> and then instead of the uh you know how they put the um the things on the side that they're like uh what are they flotation devices mm-hmm. so if you bump into something you could just have da- dongles hanging over the side that's right <laughs> i can see it now yeah that's great i love that yeah that, that'd that be excellent so uh yeah i think otherwise though you'd really have to you couldn't power them all on at once. That'd be trouble unless you really got a good set of solar panels. Our solar panel powers our fridge and the internet, and that's about it. So it's you know it's good, but I don't see. It. I think you're going to need to really beef that up to to power all your Macs at once on a boat. Yeah, I think that's how we would recognize Stevens. It would have a Mac barge, and it would always have the lights turned off because the batteries would be empty. Yeah, <laughs> be a third barge with just solar. A drift in England. That mm-hmm. would be. Let's see. <laughs> This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by Squarespace. Make your next move with Squarespace because it is the platform that makes it easy to create a website for your next idea. Complete with everything you need, unique domain names, award-winning templates, online stores, portfolios, blog and podcast hosting, on and on. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that meets 
all of your needs, lets you do all of that stuff. And the best part is there's nothing to install. There's no server patches to worry about. No upgrades are needed because Squarespace has it all covered. You just don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. They have award-winning 24-7 customer support if you need any help. Let you quickly and easily grab a unique domain name. And all of those templates are beautifully designed for you to show off your great ideas. I've been using Squarespace to build websites for people for years. I just started a new one last week for a, a small nonprofit here in Memphis. And it's so easy to get something up and running in just a few hours. Clients are always impressed with how quickly I can get something that looks really good up and running. Squarespace plans start at just $12 a month, but you can start with no credit card required by going to squarespace.com slash MPU. When you decide to sign up, use the offer code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name and to show your support for the show. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash MPU to get 10% off your first purchase with the code MPU. We thank Squarespace for their support of the show and all of Relay FM. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. I guess we should get back to emoji. Um, something I've always been kind of fascinated about, and I don't really know the story. I was wondering you could share with us. How do you make new emoji? That that is a complicated question, but the uh, the, the the short part of it is that. Every new emoji somewhere along the line had a proposal written by someone. Some of the proposals are written by major vendors like Apple or Google. Uh, Google was behind some of the push to have some more sort of gender equality on the emoji keyboard. Apple was behind the push for some of the uh, extra, the disability sort of related emojis and accessibility emojis. So someone has to write a proposal along the way to make the case for a new emoji. Um, They'd send that to Unicode, the Unicode Consortium, which approves all the text characters in the world and effectively unicode needs to to agree that it's a good addition emoji something that people don't necessarily realize have a completely different rule book to normal unicode characters traditionally normal unicode characters needed to you needed to prove that this character was in common use somewhere that was the, always the criteria for being added to unicode you'd show street signs or transcripts of documents and you'd say look here's this character that's been printed before and has a real it's not made up it's a legitimate character and this is why you need to add it whereas emoji got its own kind of rules where you can proactively make the case to say this is why it would be a useful addition and if unicode agrees they will include it in a new version of the unicode standard which will eventually get supported on your phones and computers and when you talk about unicode that Could you just kind of explain the organization a bit? Because I don't even really understand how this all ties together. The history of Unicode is the easiest thing to do as a long-term Mac user is to remember 10, 15 years ago when you'd get documents that just wouldn't open because they'd be in the wrong format. Either they'd be from another language that your computer doesn't support, or if you remember the early web, sometimes you'd go to some websites and... There'd be things like picking the encoding, whether you're in sort of Latin this or any other character sets. And the whole problem was that every country and every computer had its own different way of encoding text. And the whole point of Unicode was, as always, with any standards body to say, look, what happens if we had one standard for text where every character that's ever existed in any language is in this giant, giant table uh, that we would list every character and give it a unique entry? And... That's what Unicode was. It started off as uh, sort of, I guess, a project and became a nonprofit that now runs the Unicode standard. And members like Apple and Google, they rely on it heavily because Unicode powers our writing systems. It, It determines which characters we can type on a computer. And if there is no Unicode character for it, we can't type it. So it's sort of a, it's a nonprofit body that oversees that technical standard for all text. Now, I, from, you know, talking with my children, I realized that um, younger people today, to younger people today, emoji are an absolute form of communication, and they're quite passionate about it. How intense does it get when you're choosing new emoji each year? If you can say, I don't even know if you're allowed to talk about what happens. Yeah, I mean, well, so there's minutes published, although they're fairly, 
dry. There are minutes published of every Unicode meeting, but it's sort of, you know, it doesn't go into the nuance of exactly how the discussion went. It's more, here's a proposal and was it agreed or not? Maybe there's some supporting documents to say why or why it wasn't agreed. You know what the most passionate people get about is often technical issues. You know, is this emoji going to cause some technical complication? Because the people on the committee that decide, effectively, it's a technical committee. So they really need to judge, I guess, is this going to break anything in our text rendering? If you add too many emojis at once, is it going to be a problem to roll out on sort of apps that have user bases in countries with older phones, for instance? Uh, RAM is an issue on some phones. But then you've got the emoji subcommittee that might be looking more at whether this is a good emoji or not. And, you know, everyone gets along pretty well. It's kind of an odd group, given it's a group of people from Apple and Google and Microsoft and Twitter and me from Emojipedia that it's kind of an odd thing for people effectively at competing companies to have to work together on something that's so, I don't know, it's kind of like, it's fun and amusing, but it's, yeah, it's serious and people take it seriously. So you've... You've, you've got to make the case and, and try and get the best thing through. And I think sometimes the best stuff gets through and sometimes you get some kind of boring emojis that got added because, I don't know, I guess committees are always problematic like that, right? I, like, I don't understand. Sometimes the, you'll see multiple emoji of basically the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> you get yeah. that from Japan a lot. A lot of the Japanese origin emoji, I mean, they weren't ever meant to be a universal standard as such. Different companies in Japan originally had sort of competing emoji sets, and it was Unicode that unified them into one. But what they often did, it was sort of a subjective test, where literally people sat down and tried to map out all the competing emoji standards in Japan, mostly three of them, and sort of say, well, these ones are effectively the same emoji, like these three here, they're all the hospital, fine, we'll group them under one code point. But other times they might go, well, this one has a front-facing train and this one has a sideways-facing train. We need to make them separate. And so the Japanese set has what appears like a bunch of redundancies. And often that's, I guess, kind of confusing because people look at the keyboard and they're like, what What the heck is all this doing here? You know? Yeah, well, I don't understand why there are multiple trains and yet there is no lightsaber in the emoji. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) what world are we living in, guys? How do we fix this? A lightsaber is copyrighted by chance? I don't know. How about a flashlight <laughs> with a green beam? <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. I would love to see uh, certain companies' lawyers jump all over that. Uh, that, is one, that is one factor. <laughs> you do get um, yeah, a lot of requests for sports teams is a big one, but nothing yeah. copyrighted. No copyright in the emoji sure. set. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel like that would be... Whew. I think I think that you'd have a few companies' lawyers raising their hands, going, "Yeah, we don't want to support this flashlight with colored beam on our emoji keyboard. We're a bit worried about similarity." So you're telling me that I ask all the Mac Parishes listeners to write an email to the Unicode uh, committee. I'm still not going to get my lightsaber. Is that what you're telling me? I, I think that could be. Yes, I think that'd be very interesting <laughs> to see. I, I I don't see it happening in uh, my lifetime. <laughs> uh, lawyers are in everything, man. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, uh, is, yeah, that's a common thing, lawyers, hey? One thing we touched on a few minutes ago, and I'm sure we've all had this experience, is that emoji are rendered differently on every platform, right? So Apple has its set of images, Google has its set, Samsung has its set, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are many, many sets to these. And sometimes those cause, I think, confusion, right, as far as interpretation of what the image may mean. But is that just a... Is that a result of sort of emojis beginnings of being out of multiple companies in Japan and everyone just sort of out on their own making their own art? Yeah, it's it's it. I guess there's a few reasons for it. I mean, the main one fundamentally is that Unicode has always pre emoji been very, I guess, assertive in saying that it doesn't really define what an emoji what a character looks like. They've always been sort of quite clear that they're defining the semantic meaning of it and leaving it up to fonts. You know, we've always had fonts that design glyphs in particular very, very differently, and Unicode didn't want to get trapped where, you know, they say this is what a percent sign needs to look like, and if you want to design a different one, you need a new code point. So it's been sort of almost a fundamental part of Unicode to say, no, 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 we say this is the percent sign, and you will design it however you want. And it kind of I guess it breaks down a bit with emoji because, like, they mean more. There is no semantic meaning for some of them. We 
apply the meaning based on what it looks like often. We don't know what it's meant to mean. We just know what we see. And I guess that's the trouble, right? Is the fundamental reason that Unicode existed was for glyphs and characters. And then when you apply it to emoji, yeah, you, you, sometimes maybe you do need Unicode to step in and go, no, no, it's very important that this face has happy eyes or doesn't have happy looking eyes because it changes the meaning in particular. And that's, that's I guess, the trouble. And we had a real good demonstration of that. Was it last year or the year before where um, there was an emoji for a gun that many platform developers decided to turn into a squirt gun. And yes. a squirt gun ah. has a very different <laughs> meaning than an actual gun. And uh, it, it really was pretty controversial at the time. I would say that's probably the most, that has to be the most problematic change in an emoji that I've ever seen. That unilaterally overnight Apple alone changed their design was the trouble as well. It wasn't something that vendors all somehow agreed to do at once, which might have you know, if had they decided, it might have been complicated to coordinate that sort of thing. But had Apple even signaled maybe in advance to say publicly, look, we want we're going to change this next year or something, it might have given other vendors a chance to decide if they want to go that direction. But you're right, we ended up with one code point for what's called uh, pistol is the name of the code point that looked like a toy on Apple platforms looked like a weapon on other phones. And yeah, that's I mean, I'm not aware of anyone that was accidentally convicted of anything in court or any <laughs> any legal issues on it, but there's absolutely the potential, right, that someone sends a, a message thinking they're sending a toy and then they're actually sending a weapon is yeah, it's it's not just it's not just problematic. It it could be could be dangerous. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking there there's isn't there an emoji as well for a sword? There is a sword. Yes, that's the the, the yeah. There's a sword. There's a bomb. What if the sword to Apple was a toy lightsaber instead of a sword? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, Apple and Disney have a close relationship. You know, just make it happen. Yeah. They could do that thing. You know how some people sort of say like that they slowly Photoshop uh, a photo in their family. There's sort of, you see different pranks over the years where people slowly every month slightly change a photo frame to either turn them into Mickey Mouse or they kind of put an old version of themselves. Maybe Apple could change the sword a few pixels every year. And then 10 years, it looks like a lightsaber, but no one noticed. <laughs> I'm willing to play the long game there. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that, but, but, but it is interesting for the, for the committee, as you're coming up with ideas for a new emoji, uh, you're not really attaching an intention for it. For instance, the pistol versus the toy pistol. You don't say in the Unicode description that it's meant to be an actual pistol, right? It's just, it's just the word pistol, right, at the end of the day. Yeah, and there there is sort of the, the backwards compatibility to look at, that that one came from Japan in the first place. So even though it's not set in the standard, it has to be done this way, it is quite different when you change an existing emoji versus making a brand new one. I think it's sort of a bit of a, a free-for-all when a new emoji comes out is what does it look like? I think the biggest example recently was maybe the woozy face, which is a bit drunk looking, but it's not. It doesn't say it has to be drunk or intoxicated. It just says that it's woozy. And if you look at all the different vendor designs, some of them look like sort of, I don't know, <laughs> a bit confusing. Apple's one definitely doesn't look intoxicated. It looks sort of, I don't know, like it's having a bad day, I guess, but in, a, in an abstract way. And th- those ones are the free-for-all. It's just the old ones that you try and keep backward compatibility where you can. I just love that someone came up with the name Woozy Face for an emoji. It's like a, a committee had to choose that name, right? You guys yes. choose the name as well, correct? Right? It's like, what were the other options, you know? Oh, I feel like there was another issue. There was a, an emoji a few years ago that often they have a long name and a short name as well. You have a code point name, and then you have kind of a common name, I guess, that's localized. There was one a few years ago that was encoded called Grinning Face with one large eye and one small eye. And uh, that was sort of nicknamed Crazy Face as the short term. And that was sort of then deemed to be a bit ableist. It's sort of potentially making fun of the mentally ill. And it was tr- problematic. So the new name after much consideration was Zany Face. So, uh, yeah, there are there, there's a whole committee going in to try to figure out what name is not problematic in any way, but also somehow describes the emoji. Well, I'm looking at all the Emojipedia listings for Woozy Face, and you have all the vendors there, and this is Drunk Face. It's Drunk Face. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it basically is. Uh, but as you can see, there's there's quite a variation, and people have all kinds of creative versions of what they think this emoji is doing. I think Apple's is actually the most popular in some ways because it's it is more ambiguous. Though you can use Apple's in a more you know some people kind of post it like I screwed something up, and they'll put Apple's one because it kind of might look like I'm making a face rather than I'm intoxicated right now, which yeah. is maybe a bit more safe for work. The, the Google emoji is definitely three sheets to the wind, though. I'm looking at that guy's <laughs> eyes aren't even looking in the same direction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and something to think about, I mean, on the committee side of things, things like internationalization is big. Countries that maybe a drunk face might not be approved or might not be considered a good thing. Apple recently had the issue where the Taiwan flag mysteriously no longer shows on yes. iPhones from China. Uh, so the companies are very aware of international issues, and what they don't want is to have to pick and choose different emojis for different countries where they can help it, because what a pain. That Taiwan issue has caused crashes before, not deliberately, but when you have to have an emoji font that kind of displays very differently in different countries, it's just such a low-level part of the OS that, yeah, companies do not want that. Universally, they want one set of emoji that works in every country, and every exception they have to make, they are not happy about. If you can say on on an interview, what is the silliest battle over an emoji you've ever witnessed in this process? <laughs> what can I say? What I can say is personally, I can tell you what I think about things. I can't necessarily share, you know, sure. discussions that happen in private. What I can tell you is there was an emoji that it wasn't particularly problematic. I think it did end up getting approved for let me have a look did it get approved <laughs> let me check this i lose track of what is coming out in the future years that isn't known and what has come out already uh yes there was an emoji proposed for a potted plant and i like plants i'm all on board for plants but i didn't feel like it sort of stacked up there are a lot of different plant emojis already i didn't think it brought a new sentiment to the table necessarily but Something like this kicked around for many, many meetings where sort of, you know, you make the case for a potted plant and then I'm sitting there going, well, I don't care that much. I'm not bothered by it. It's not offensive, but I don't think it adds that much. And yeah, you do get these, you get in these, I say, ridiculous discussions where you're sort of thinking, have I been arguing about a potted plant emoji for two years now <laughs> and not approving it? Uh, and in the end, I think I was just like, fine, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um I don't, I don't care enough. It's not a bad emoji. It's just I don't think it's a great emoji. Uh, so you do get that sort of thing where maybe you can look at the list and designed by committee, you see a few that sneak through that really aren't that great, but because they're not offensive or problematic, they kind of slide through the process easier than something like Woozy Face, which is more fun, but a bit more problematic. One thing I wanted to, to ask you about is one of the, the my favorite features on Emojipedia is getting to look at how different platforms render these different images. So like just because it's a random one, I'm going to put the burrito emoji page in the show notes and they all look like burritos, but they all, you know, have slightly different takes on it. How in the world do y'all keep this up to date? I mean, you've got all this historical data, all this comparative data. I can't even imagine how many, you know, individual image files are part of your website. How do you all manage all of that that data and keeping up with all these changes? Yeah, this is definitely maybe the hardest part of the whole site, uh, the most the most hands on deck anyway, that it's not even our most popular feature as such. But I feel like this is sort of our public service that if we're not going to do this, who else is going to do it? And as you sort of know, when you're doing tech archiving and tech history, that once it disappears, it's very hard to get back. It's much easier to do in the moment. So... Obviously, the first thing we do is we try and be on top of any new updates that's mm -hmm. happening. We have a good relationship with the vendors generally, so that's, I guess that's the easiest part now. Now that we're established and vendors can work with us, that's much easier than it used to be. Um, years ago, when I, when I first started, it was a matter of just every iOS update and every Mac update. I'd look at the emoji keyboard, I'd have two, I'd hold my iPhone and uh, my girlfriend at the time, her iPhone, I'd hold them next to each other, and I'd scroll the pages one at a time to like go through each page of the emoji keyboard to look for changes because there wasn't a good way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. In other years, we've managed to extract images out of emoji fonts. We've had issues of having to buy old devices, jailbreak old iPhones. We only went back a few years ago and 
track down every iOS version to make sure we hadn't missed any updates. And it turned out, when was it? There was an iOS update in about 2012. I think it was iOS 5.1 that added a bunch of new emojis, but they didn't put them on the keyboard and no one knew they were there. They were there for about six months. (laughs) <laughs> and they were in the font they were supported the whole time but no one knew because they weren't on the keyboard and we didn't know how to like figure out that they were in there and i went back and chatted to some of the designers at apple later about some odd choices in there i think that one of the books was purple in that update rather than even though the name was orange book there was all kinds of weird stuff in that update but yeah there were things like that that we kind of came across only years later by sort of extracting fonts out of an ipod touch bought off ebay hmm. yeah i remember at some point you had me boot up like snow leopard or lion or something like hey can you can you snatch these files for me when you were going through this work so i I feel like i've i've done my part to help this um yeah there's a there's a lot that went on a lot that and to double check because like no one else is archiving this you feel so much responsibility that yes it's a dumb little picture on the internet from a device 10 years ago but if we get this wrong it will probably never get corrected if we get the date wrong of release or which update it was in or if we somehow got the wrong image included then you know maybe this that would annoy me forever knowing this like some images that are just wrong on there so i'd much much prefer yeah if i can get people with older macs older iphones whatever it takes to be confident that we've got the right images on the right update is yeah super important and one of the cool things about the site, and I encourage everyone to take a look at the burrito, I'll put the woozy face in too, is it shows the history of each platform. So if you click on it, you can see the various iterations they've had of it over the years. For instance, Apple added tinfoil to their burrito a few years ago. Um, and it's just kind of fun to see the evolution of them as well. Yeah, there's definitely, especially if you go to some, I'm trying to think of one of the the better ones that is a good example from, that goes all the way back to Japan. Maybe the, the there's one that's these days called the Spiral Shell. And if you look that up, again, in Japan, they didn't actually have names necessarily. They would just look like how they looked. So at the time, Apple, you might remember on iOS, years and years ago, it was a sort of a fan-shaped shell. And then these days, you can see subtly a bit more detail put into every single release and yeah, other vendors, Android, uh, Microsoft, Samsung, they've all changed the design sometimes multiple times over the years. And yeah, it's kind of interesting looking back to see sometimes you wonder why. Other times it's kind of clear if they come up with a new design direction, they need to update to match that. Yeah, and it is interesting how many of these designs, like Apple tends to be more realistic. I guess that's a question for you is, is what your you know view is on different vendors take, but like the difference between the way Apple renders these versus Microsoft is significant. Yeah, we get a lot of grief from people about Microsoft set, which you know what, it looks amazing on Windows. It really does. I like Microsoft set in the context of viewing it on Windows. Like if you boot up an Emojipedia window on Windows and see all these little emojis there in the system, it looks great. But when you can, when you hold them side by side against other vendors, especially Apple being photorealistic, they look odd. You know, they've got this big, thick outline around them. They're quite simple designs. I respect the idea of trying to convey an emoji in an icon-like design, trying to simplify it down to its core elements. I, I appreciate that. But it seems like for whatever, for whatever reason, end users universally say much better things about Apple's designs than they do about Microsoft's or even Google's. Google sends a lot of effort trying to kind of figure out the most compelling parts of the emoji and just put that in and nothing more. But as I say, all I see is feedback from users that they love Apple's set and there's mixed degrees of of enjoyment on all the other sets. That's just a, such a different take is all. You know, it's like the uh, burrito in Microsoft kind of looks like a brown spaceship to me. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah but i i get i get where they're going and and honestly kind of that was that's just a that's just an aesthetic a design aesthetic that that works or doesn't work for people i i i actually really like the fact that the unicode committee doesn't design the emoji that they let the developers each kind of have their own take on it i like that too i do think that i think the faces are probably one area where vendors very quickly want to converge on a design. I think all the smileys do change the meaning quite dramatically with subtle changes. But things like the objects, yeah, I think it's great. I like seeing the variety of different wraps and different designs from different companies and that sometimes they have sort of Easter eggs or significance to different countries. In Twitter's set, the office building is 
Twitter HQ. It's the headquarters in San Francisco. If you look at their office building, whereas other vendors just have a generic office, Apple, obviously, I say famously, sort of replaces the generic items with branded ones. So the laptop computer emoji is a MacBook and the desktop computer emoji is an iMac. I don't know. I think I think that's fine. I don't think that's problematic. But the faces, I think vendors really do want to try and nearly nail the same design because otherwise you do get misunderstandings happening quite a bit off this sort of thing. With you know the growth of emoji and the way it's been adopted everywhere, and I know this is kind of a silly question, but what, what's a good way for users to start using it more? Like I, I do know people of a certain age that are resistant to emoji but want to use it better. Um, I always tell folks that, you know, if you look at Apple, when you type in words like this this morning, I told my daughter to get me some tacos and it gave me the emoji for tacos as I typed the word. But what are some ways to get better at using it? Like, I, I'm kind of intimidated when I send Jeremy a message because he's the Emojipedia <laughs> guy. So I don't know if you know this. I've never sent you an emoji because I'm afraid I'm going to do it wrong when I'm talking to you. No, that's the first thing to realize. There is no doing it wrong. That's the, That's the beauty of it, that as much as... I'm someone who runs a website that is dedicated to defining the meaning of an emoji. In reality, I mean, emoji use is meant to be fun and playful, and what you think it means says enough about your personality that if I know who you are and you use an emoji in a way that I wouldn't use it, I can probably project what I think you're using it for. I guess I, I think the the main thing you'd want to do is to be playful, to be a bit fun with it, and to, to look around and think, oh, what's an interesting emoji I might use? What you do want to maybe double check, not to drum up any business, but you might want to double check alternative meetings on Emojipedia first. I know a politician just uh, from the UK just a few days ago uh, innocently posted about uh, in lockdown uh, something about eggplants and was immediately told by hundreds of people that the eggplant emoji is not used as a vegetable. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, things like that. So you want to maybe double check an alternative meaning, but otherwise, I think honestly, just have a bit of fun with them. That it actually doesn't matter if you get the meaning wrong at all. Is what I would say. I think it's also interesting maybe to browse the new lists as well, just to see what's come out. That's maybe an easy way. There's so many emojis that maybe it's overwhelming at first. But what happens if you just look at the list from say last year or the year before? Uh, browse those like emoji eleven dot o or emoji twelve dot o, and you can just see oh what's new and how are people using them. As we're all stuck home in this pandemic, uh, one of the things we do in our family is we share um, social media and different things to the TV through the Apple TV, uh, sharing from our phones every night. And the kids have been sharing with me these great uh, Instagram and TikTok threads of their parents using the emoji with the uh, laughter. Cry. There's a there's an emoji with lines under the ice, which I understand yes. is meant to be that you're it's hilarious. You're you're crying because you're laughing so hard. Yes, yes, the face with tears of joy. Yeah, yeah, that's yes, the one. And the so many people one. are using it inappropriately where something bad happens. It's usually the parent of the kid making the post some some bad news and then they put that emoji on and everybody thinks it's very funny that they you have tears of joy and something they shouldn't. <laughs> and uh which is that, very funny to be honest. Yeah, that is funny it, when it, that happens. It is a thing on its own, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I think, I mean, vendors are trying to fix this a little, like Apple made the change a few years ago where if you only send up to, is it three individual emoji characters in one message, in iMessage, they'll blow them up and make them bigger, but then they're still tiny when you send them alongside text, so I don't know what the solution is there, actually, because a lot of it's just pure visibility, right? It's just people, especially older people, often don't have as good eyesight or anyone with a vision impairment, and you often can't see see what it is and if you don't know that's the difference i mean to to the rest of us fine you can see it's laughing but if you can't tell that then you're gonna you're gonna mess it up aren't you so yeah maybe if you are worried look into it first yeah okay for our, our older listeners what are the five they're most likely to screw up i think we've got tears of joy and eggplant so far Yes. Uh, uh, whew, another another popular one you see, which I don't think is problematic when you screw up, but it is problematic if you if you mess it up on social media. Is there's one that's of a uh, emoji? It's a building with a love heart on it and the letter H, and it's people use it often as sort of a hospital with a love heart on there to kind of go, you know, get well soon, Grandma. Hope you're feeling better. But that is a a love hotel from Japan, a hotel you can hire by the hour. 
uh, for, <laughs> okay. for whatever you want in particular. But uh, yeah, some people some people think that's a hospital because it looks a lot like a hospital. So maybe maybe double check. There is a hospital emoji. So if you want to send that, then just check which one is the hospital first. I think it's a popular one. I'm looking at the Love Hotel right now. It does yeah, do look like that? a hospital. <laughs> it does. And it's got the letter H on there on Apple yeah. anyway. On other platforms, it's just a, a love heart. That one came from Japan as well. I don't think that would get approved under today's standards if someone said we need a love hotel emoji. But uh, yes, hotels by the hour in Japan. Keep an eye out for that one. Uh, there were two also the other day that uh, came up. One uh, one is a cross-platform issue that's come up quite a lot recently. Uh, there's a, I don't quite know what she's sort of famous for, but her name is uh, Jamila Jamil, and she's, uh, I guess, an influencer of some kind. Seems all right. She seems to post some good content, and she posted something the other day with the emoji with the hand over the mouth. I don't know if you've seen this. It's called face with hand over mouth, if you want to look it up. And it has a very different design on iOS versus the other platforms. On iOS, it looks like a sort of a serious face, sort of gasping, sort of shocked. You know, I've got yeah. my hand over my mouth. And on other platforms, it's got these sort of smiling eyes. Yeah. And it looks like it's laughing. And she posted something about people, you know, tussling in the supermarket over goods. And she wanted to post like a gasping face, like, I'm shocked about this. Everyone else thought she was laughing at it and thought it was insensitive. So that's probably one to watch out for. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, it's easy. It's easy. Yeah, you can do that. And some of the drooling ones are a bit uh, a bit confusing. Uh, there's also some of them have more drool or less, and some of them, some look a bit dodgy, and others look like they're just interested in food. Others look like maybe they're interested in other people that they think are quite attractive, maybe. And so the drooling one depends on how much you want to, how much drool you think is appropriate to send, but maybe... Maybe don't send the drooling one in any of your work chats. That's good. We never, you know, 10 years, we never got around to talking about how much drool is appropriate. So I'm glad we got an there. <laughs> an appropriate <laughs> amount of, of drool is always worth noting. I, I also, you know, it's this is kind of Apple specific, but the, you know, the sticker packs, I am such a big fan of those sticker packs. And of course I have, I, I do have my lightsaber emoji in essence through the sticker packs, which is, is not Unicode emoji. How, now how does that fit into discussions, or does it at all? You know, sticker packs have been a bit of a saving grace for Unicode because, I mean, they can't add everything, right? So by having sticker packs in the world, and Unicode has long said this, they're not worried about sticker packs. They like that sticker packs are out there because you know what they can do? They can say, hey, sorry, this isn't appropriate as an emoji. Go get someone to make a sticker pack for you. There's mm -hmm. an option for them to, yeah, figure out... A, a way to pass users off to get a, a way to get their copyrighted sports team, how to get their lightsaber. Uh, US state flags are technically possible in Unicode, but so far vendors don't seem that interested in doing them. Uh, you can palm people off and just go, hey, look, you can. Memoji is the other big one as well, that it's complicated people trying to represent themselves in emoji form. I think it's a noble goal. It's a tricky situation when you have humans on the keyboard, but. Being able to say, look, if you don't have an emoji of yourself, you can go make a Memoji, and it's not the same thing, but it's better than nothing, right? It's it's a nice option to have. I know you're using one for your uh, your Skype uh, picture. Oh, am I? <laughs> oh, I, no. Uh, you know what? That even predates Memoji. That was, uh, I think that was a unique design about five years ago of our designer that made of me, and now we could have done it in two minutes in Memoji. Yeah. <laughs> it looks a lot like Memoji. Yeah, the only trouble being, obviously, that sometimes all the Memojis can look quite similar when you get generic white guys like me. I feel like you get a lot of generic white guy Memoji on Twitter, <laughs> which uh, is a bit problematic, you know, when you see like 10 of these and you're like, are these all the same person? Because they yeah. all look like the same person sometimes. Yeah. So, Jeremy, uh, tell us some of your, we always like to end the interviews talking about some of our favorite apps and services. Are there, you know, with all the things you're doing, are there any like little apps or services that you use that just really make your life easier? Hmm, let me think. Uh, so on the Mac, Kaleidoscope. Love Kaleidoscope. It's uh, an image comparison tool. I think they compare more than images, but it's not Kaleidoscope, the old Mac uh, theming program from years and years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember yes. that one. <laughs> it's not that. I did used to make, what do they call them? Schemes, kaleidoscope schemes. I made a few back in the day. And uh, 
It's not that, my kaleidoscope schemes. Have you seen the Twitter account that pops up? Every, the, what? I don't know who runs that, but there's someone that runs a Twitter account that posts old kaleidoscope schemes. Have you either of you seen yeah, this? Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, and every now and then I made about two or three back in the day, and when it pops up, it says the name of the scheme and who it's by. So every, I don't know, every six months it must be on loop or something, because I get a bunch of people adding me to go. When it says uh, stationary, I made one called stationary, and... Uh, Every time that pops up, a bunch of people go, oh, is that you? It says stationary by Jeremy Burge. And yes, that was that was me as a nerdy 14-year-old with no games on my Mac. I had so many icon files. I still have them on my um, on my archive drive that I downloaded over the years because I wanted to customize everything, you know. Yeah. I reskinned yeah, every app, yeah. Pop it open. So, nonetheless, Kaleidoscope, modern Kaleidoscope, I don't know whether there's any clash over the name or whether the old one's gone, but anyway, it compares images. Amazing, so it can show you different layers of exactly, it can highlight the pixels that have changed. Obviously, in my line of work, you're comparing two emoji images and you want to see what's different, and you can it can highlight them, you can drag a little slider across, and there's been nothing better if you've got two images that look identical to you and you want to see where the changes are. Uh, that's something that I use, and well worth it if you ever have a job where you have to compare two image files. I'd say that's a big one for me. A little bit of an improvement over looking at your girlfriend's phone versus your phone? Yes, massive improvement. Huge productivity improvement. <laughs> uh, most of these we only found years and years later. And now, thankfully, we've got a few tools to automate this sort of thing. But it still doesn't show you where the images are on our automated tools. So we can flag them automatically to say this has changed. But if I want to see the change for myself if it's not obvious it's nice to have a tool like this that you can compare one by one uh what else i also mentioned earlier the a better find a rename and retro batch both great they're, they're strong in my utilities folder i'd have to say yeah now how much of your work do, do you do anything on your iphone beyond just communication nothing uh i mean i do plenty on my iphone but it's 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 life stuff not work stuff i think yeah. uh so what do I use? On my phone, you know what, a little app, if you ever have a need for a GPS logger, I, I log our GPS travels on the boat of where we are, of sort of logging it over time. And most most apps aren't well suited to this. They are uh, either designed around fitness, where you start and stop sort of a workout or something like that, or they there's a bunch of fancy services that try and do a good job of it, but don't. But there's an app called Follow Me with two E's, and that runs very nicely in the background and it has a million little toggles and and whatnot of how to track and when but we've got a spare old iphone on the boat that is effectively a gps logger and you can export the files later and see exactly where you went over what a period of time and i would say that's that's quite a quite a good boating tool to have on board if you ever have anything that you want to track where it is and when and you have a spare iphone to plug it into yeah as i say those apps historically take a lot of um power too so i guess if you have it plugged in then you don't have to worry about it yeah this one stays plugged in it's an iphone sitting in a drawer plugged in at all times and but actually the app does give you sort of power toggles you can set different hours of the day of when you want it to track minimum it can tap into ios's range of uh, movement to determine when it's worth turning on gps if it knows you moved a certain distance to fire it up how accurate you want it to be whether it's pinging all the time or just sending a general signal so yeah it's one of those apps that looks super super ugly a million settings but actually great for when you just need to knuckle down and get a specific set of things done so that's a, a very niche app about something that some people out there might find handy yeah nice when we can move again i'm gonna try it out yeah <laughs> yeah give that a shot when we're allowed out of the house well jeremy i uh like i said before we start recording i'm just so happy that you could uh give us some time to come on the show we're gonna have you on again someday uh, gang another thing jeremy does because he uh spends so much time talking about emoji he travels a lot and um i would recommend following his instagram account it was one of my favorite accounts um, and it still is, but I mean, just, I really enjoyed all your travel shots. Cause every time you go somewhere, you make a point of getting out and kind of capturing the, the essence of wherever you're at. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, what, what is your Instagram account, Jeremy? So it's, it's my name. So it's at, uh, Jeremy, J E R E M Y B U R G E. And yeah, come along, follow my travels at the moment. We're not traveling all that much, but, uh, you know, there's some local travels on the boat going to and from the shops, which we're allowed to do. So you'll, you'll see the boat moving towards the shop, and maybe maybe one day we'll be back on the move in a wider circle around the world. 
Yeah, and then Emojipedia, exactly how it sounds, but we'll put a link into the uh, into the show notes. Um, on Twitter, is it Jeremy Burge as well, I believe? Yeah, same on everything. You follow me on Twitter, on Instagram, Jeremy Burge on everything. Emojipedia on everything for the emoji side of it. If you follow me, you'll get some emoji stuff, but, you know, Emojipedia is there if you if you actually just want non-stop emoji news. What's new? What's changing? As I say, there's always some weird cultural clash somewhere where someone said the wrong thing with emoji or something's happening. Uh, a court case with emoji, Jeffrey Rush, an Australian actor, was in a court case where Emojipedia was cited as evidence earlier in the year. There's always always odd <laughs> emoji things coming up in the world. Yeah, it, it is interesting. And and I'm trying to use it more because I, I do think it is useful. And uh, and I love your, your website because it really gives me a better idea where I'm going with it. But But like you said, also just... Start sticking some emoji in your in your uh, text messages, Stephen. You don't emoji me very much when we message each other. Uh, where where are you on the uh, emoji spectrum? I'm not a huge emoji user. I've got a handful that I are kind of go to, but yeah, not not as big as a bunch of other people in my life. That's for sure. Yeah, I I think that's my problem. Is I get hung up on a couple that I use all all the time. And then, like the the sticker and the Star Wars sticker back, the little one with BBA giving the thumbs up. I probably used that like two thousand times conservatively <laughs> over the years. Uh, so I, you know, I, I've got to like, I've got to um, expand my palette of emoji. Jeremy, you've inspired me. I think there should there should be a random emoji button. There's one on Emojipedia to look up a random emoji, but maybe iOS needs to insert a random emoji button so you can just broaden your reach a little. Yeah, and that would be kind of fun too. Like. Um, if if we can talk to our friends at Apple to do that, just occasionally pick the most important in person in your life and have it send them a random emoji and just see what happens. <laughs> I don't think that's going to end up well. I think that's going to be. <laughs> I think that's going to be very interesting. <laughs> well, either way, gang, head head over to Emojipedia and check out all of Jeremy's work. And and uh, thanks again for coming on. We are the Mac Power Users. You can find us on Relay.fm/mpu. Um, and also you can sound off in the forums at talk.macpowerusers.com thank you to our sponsors today Smile and Squarespace and we'll see you next week